Amazon secretly owns the internet. And no, I'm not talking about how they dominate the online retail world, like how you can buy groceries, a piano, and a house all in the same order and have it delivered to your house in 48 hours. I'm not talking about Audible or Kindle or Amazon Prime Video. I'm talking about how their biggest customers are people we never expect. Netflix, Apple, Spotify, NASA, Airbnb, Sony, McDonald's, Zoom, and there's plenty more. It's not just us that are dependent on Amazon. Major companies, governments, universities, and organizations depend on them too. This is because of their cloud service, AWS, or Amazon Web Services. AWS has been around since 2006. So while I'm sure many people have heard of it, from my experience talking to people outside of the tech space, very few people realize how much they're inadvertently interacting with Amazon on a daily basis since some of their most used apps use AWS behind the scenes, nor how a portion of their monthly subscription payments to apps like Netflix, Spotify, and Photoshop go into Amazon's pockets. And one of the most surprising things is that while AWS is unknown to the majority of the world's population, in 2023 alone, its operating income, so the amount of money left after paying for expenses, made up over two thirds of Amazon's total operating income. Meaning, AWS is more profitable than all other Amazon businesses combined and has been since 2015. So even if everyone in the world stopped shopping on Amazon, they would still more than survive. So let's break down what AWS is, why a billion dollar corporation like Netflix would choose to pay Amazon $340 million a year for the service, and how AWS and other cloud services alongside the AI boom may contribute to worsening climate change. Amazon Web Services is considered a cloud service provider, offering what is commonly referred to as cloud computing services. When we think of the cloud, we usually only consider its advantages from a personal user perspective. For instance, iCloud allows us to save our photos from our iPhone to the cloud, which not only makes sure that they're safe in case we ever lose our phone, but also allows us to access these photos at any time from any other device. Google Drive lets us collaborate with our coworkers on a document. Because of the cloud, Multiple people on multiple different devices around the world can work on it at the same time. Dropbox lets us upload huge files directly to the cloud and share the link with hundreds of people, which is much faster and easier than having to email it to each of them. iCloud, Google Drive, and Dropbox are all examples of cloud storage services. Even though our personal experience with the cloud usually revolves around storing files, this is just one aspect of what a cloud service provider like AWS can offer. In reality, the cloud has much bigger responsibilities beyond storing our personal files. Before we get into AWS, let's clarify some things. First, the cloud. It's easy to think of the cloud as this mystical place in the sky that we can't see but we know exists. But the cloud is not really a cloud. It's very much on Earth. The cloud actually refers to a collection of data centers scattered throughout the world. These data centers are huge warehouses, and like the rest of the internet, they're all interconnected by cables that span the globe, whether underground, overground, or underwater. A data center can house hundreds of thousands to even millions of servers and other hardware. A server is essentially just a computer. It just doesn't have a monitor or a keyboard or any other parts that we're used to interacting with externally, but it still has all the crucial internal hardware. The hardware always includes the CPU, or the central processing unit. The CPU is the brain of any computer and is the entire foundation of cloud computing. And it may also include a storage drive, like a hard drive for instance. This is where your files are stored. Before the cloud, you would just save your files to your own hard drive inside your computer, or maybe a flash drive. When you save your files to the cloud, all you're doing is saving your files to a different computer's hard drive. That's it. If you can imagine that you found a really long cord that connects your computer to a server in a data center somewhere else in the world, that's what saving your files to the cloud is. The only difference is that instead of one long continuous cord, you use Wi-Fi to wirelessly connect to your closest router. The router connects to the modem, and the modem connects to an endless chain of cables that physically connect your router to a data center anywhere in the world. So. As a cloud service provider, AWS owns and operates a ton of these data centers throughout the world. But why would any business, government, institution, or even individual need access to a cloud service provider beyond file storage? Well, if they maintain any type of software, they need hardware, like servers, 
to run it on. Software needs hardware. Without it, it's just lines of text. Writing code to create the software requires nothing but a computer and some programming knowledge. But managing the hardware it needs to run on can be much harder, much riskier, and much more expensive as the number of people using the software increases. I mean, there was a point when the web was first created that it was easy to get away with just a few servers in your office or in your home. But that was when smartphones didn't exist yet. Websites were just static pages like this, and it was common for sites to be really slow or crash when there were too many users. But now, for the majority of software we use today, there's an expectation we have as users that whatever application we're using will be quick and reliable, and that the data it's showing will be accurate while our own data will be kept safe and encrypted. We no longer tolerate an app that crashes because there's too many users at once. And we expect the software will work properly for us at any time and at any place in the world. So these organizations have two options. They can manage the hardware themselves or they can have a cloud service provider do it for them. If you wanted to create a new version of Instagram and manage the hardware yourself, that could require you to have servers distributed all over a certain region or all over the world. You'd have to hire a team to manage them and security to keep them safe from burglars. You'd have to constantly buy or rent servers as the amount of users increase. So many things to pay for and so many things that could go wrong. To sum it up, for organizations that aren't worth tens of billions of dollars, it would be a headache at best and near impossible at worst. Cloud service providers like AWS take on that burden. They build and manage the data centers, do all the hardware troubleshooting, and guarantee that their customer software will be running quickly and reliably while their data is kept safe. In exchange, they provide customers with an admin dashboard where they can specify, for instance, how many servers they want their software running on and where in the world they're located and leave Amazon to do the rest. A simple analogy would be, if you need groceries, you could either start a garden and a farm and work all year to manage it throughout the seasons. You'll be able to get your food directly from your backyard and you'll probably save money in the long run. Or you can just go to the grocery store. AWS is the grocery store. So why would a $300 billion company like Netflix pay Amazon $340 million a year to use AWS instead of just building their own data centers? After all, it wouldn't be unusual for companies that size. For instance, Meta has always managed their own data centers across the globe. So all of our data and interactions with Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Oculus lives in one of their centers. And like Meta, it would allow Netflix to have more direct control over their hardware and save money in the long run. Well, according to a 2016 article on Netflix website, written by a few of their VPs of engineering at the time, they explain how Netflix actually used to manage their own data centers. But in August of 2008, back before they were a streaming app and instead were mailing DVDs to people's homes, they experienced a major database corruption and for three days could not ship DVDs to their members. It was at this point where they realized that scaling up their own data centers to support the constant demand for Netflix would be difficult. And they would be better off just using Amazon's data centers since they already had the infrastructure in place. This allowed Netflix to easily handle the increasing demand. More users meant they needed more servers to run their software on. And with AWS, they'd always be readily available. So we as everyday consumers are not the only ones locked into Amazon's convenience. It's worth noting that many of the larger companies that use AWS or any other cloud service provider take a hybrid approach where they may manage their own servers for some parts of their software and use one or more cloud service providers for other parts. But it's not always clear which parts of the software live where unless the company comes out and says it. Even though Netflix relies heavily on AWS, they do still manage their own CDNs or content delivery networks, meaning they're still managing some hardware. Also, while it hasn't been officially confirmed by Apple, it's rumored that they use AWS for iCloud storage in addition to using their own data centers. So there's a possibility that even when you're saving your photos to iCloud, you're still inadvertently using Amazon behind the scenes. But as I've mentioned a few times, AWS is not the only cloud service provider. Even though AWS has the largest market share, Microsoft Azure is a close second, followed by Google Cloud Platform and a few other tech giants. Despite Salesforce actually becoming the first cloud service provider in 1999, Amazon was able to come out with AWS seven years later in 2006 and has held onto the lead since inception. 
Regardless, all the major cloud service providers have more or less the same features. Since LinkedIn and Xbox are owned by Microsoft, all of their data is with Microsoft Azure. And since YouTube is owned by Google, everything on YouTube, including this video, is stored and processed by Google Cloud Platform. So when you click the subscribe button, you're communicating directly with the server in a Google data center. Try it. Even web apps like Squarespace, Shopify, and Wix that let you create your own website run on either Google Cloud Platform, AWS, or a combination of the two. Meaning that if you ever use one to build your own personal or business website, then behind the scenes, your website is being powered by one of these cloud service providers. So in all fairness, I should say Amazon, Microsoft, and Google own the internet. And by own, I just mean they dominate it. They own the data centers, but not the data. But like with anything that makes our lives easier, there's always a hidden cost. Data centers need a lot of electricity to run. Tens of thousands of servers need to be up and running 24 seven. And when they are running, they generate a lot of heat. You know how your laptop can get really hot? Imagine thousands of them stacked on top of each other. Heat can damage the servers and IT equipment in the data center. So data centers have to constantly be cooled. There's a few different methods and systems data centers use to remove heat from the air, but they also use up a ton of electricity. This can be an issue when the electricity is generated using coal and fossil fuels, since they can release greenhouse gases. Right now, data centers only make up for 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. But with most countries pledging to achieve net zero greenhouse gases by 2050, there's not much more room to spare. Depending on the data center, these cooling systems might also require water to keep the rooms cool. And not just a small amount. One data center can use over one to five million gallons of water each day. While this isn't as much as some other industries like agriculture, with people increasingly spending more and more time on the internet, the already existing strain on fresh water sources from droughts caused by global warming, and now the rise of AI, which requires even more CPU power than just scrolling on the web previously did, there is a concern about how our natural resources will be able to keep up with the rapidly growing tech industry. As the industry grows, so do the data centers which means they need more electricity to power them and more fresh water to cool them. Some solutions have been to build the data centers in colder climates so that they're easier to cool or to use more renewable energies like solar and wind instead of electric. Microsoft is even experimenting with placing data centers underwater since water cools heat more effectively than air and it would be much more energy efficient. Both Microsoft and Google not only pledged to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, but also pledged to be water positive meaning they'll replenish more water than they use. But if you want to see what data actually looks like inside of data centers, check out my previous video all about data storage.